tonight on CBC Vancouver News. There are a lot of people that are really, really not doing well in all this. The small intestine is... Why your child's classroom won't be reopening anytime soon. Also... And I want them to come back home. Still stranded. Canadians stuck in India blast Ottawa's plan to get them home. And... When the nurses come out of the hot zone into the warm zone, they're usually drenched in sweat. Inside the hot zone, we go behind the front lines of the COVID-19 unit at BC's biggest hospital. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. It wasn't what many parents and students wanted to hear. BC schools will not be reopening anytime soon. The education minister says the province is still studying how and when to resume in-class learning. And as Tina Lovegreen reports, a timetable to reopen classrooms remains unclear. Yeah. How much surface area would you have? You'd have this much, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. It's been over a month now that Krista Zigurdsson has picked up the roles of both mom and teacher. This whole situation has just made me realize how wonderful schools are and the way that our kids are completely, at least ours anyway, not all kids, obviously, but ours are so conditioned to being in a social environment. And when you take that away, it, it, it's really like pulling the rug out from under them. Among the challenges. We are with them. We are answering, constantly answering questions, troubleshooting all the technology. I mean, I feel like I'm an IT specialist now. Like countless of other parents, she was eager to find out when school might be back in session. But the education minister made no such announcement. Instead, he said the province is still taking notes. Ministry staff are researching and we're contacting other jurisdictions to understand the planning and protocols that have been put in place for a controlled return to in-class instruction. New Zealand, for example, uh, students will go back to school starting tomorrow. Quebec, which has been the hardest hit by COVID-19, has decided to let smaller children go back to school starting next month. It is kind of weighing risks and, and, and benefits of, of children having them at home or children of, or having them at school. And then the balance clearly weighs that they're better off uh, at school. Some experts say based on the available evidence, smaller children are less likely to get severely infected and less likely to be part of the chain of transmission. So they argue keeping them at home might actually be worse. They are exposed or possibly exposed to more violence, that they uh, cannot kind of move that much, that they, they can start to, to eat in a different way. Uh, they miss the contact of the school and also the training that teachers can give them. Uh, so, um, and in addition also, there's children with extra needs. Uh, they cannot be provided those needs when they are at home. But in BC, no plans will be announced until all the logistics are worked out. They really miss their teachers and they miss their friends. They miss the people. But there's no end date yet for this province-wide homeschool experiment. Oh, you asked me what these mean? are? Okay. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. To the latest COVID-19 numbers in BC now, there are 55 new cases to report tonight most stemming from known outbreaks at poultry plants. But BC's top doctor says she still thinks we could ease some restrictions next month. Dan Burrett joins us live with more. Dan, why is Dr. Henry so optimistic? It comes down to knowing where the cases of COVID-19 are, Anita and Mike. Henry says recent community outbreaks, like the ones at two Metro Vancouver poultry plants, as you mentioned, are known ones. They can count how many people are affected and try to contain the spread there. Henry says she believes BC could still ease some COVID-19 restrictions by mid to end of May, despite those outbreaks. Doesn't set us back uh, necessarily, but it is important for us. It's one of the indicators that we are watching very carefully that we're ready to get to that place uh, where we can start um, lifting restrictions and and having more contact within within of course the, the the core fundamentals of of the distancing, the hand hygiene, and the absolute staying away um, and staying home when you're sick. Henry notes most people with COVID-19 now are linked to others. For example, a family member of someone who may have worked in one of the affected poultry plants. So public health officials are really focused on tracing those unlinked cases of coronavirus. 
As for today's numbers, B.C. has lost two more people to COVID-19, 105 so far. As you mentioned, we have 55 new cases, just over 2,000 in total now. 94 patients are in hospital. That's down slightly. And over 1,200 people have now recovered, more than half of all cases. Anita, Mike? Thanks very much, Dan. Well, for weeks now, we've been hearing the stories of COVID-19 patients and from families who've lost loved ones. Now, CBC News is getting an exclusive look at the battle on the front lines of BC's biggest hospital. They're scared when they come in, right? They're scared of getting a breathing tube put in. They're scared of what's going to happen. Uh, and we're scared for them, to be honest. So it feels like you're scuba diving almost. You're in this environment, you're wearing your, your, your uh, visor, you're wearing your face mask, your respirator, your gowns and your gloves. And for me, it just feels a little bit surreal because you literally have that barrier between you and the outside world. Our Tanya Fletcher is finding out what life is like for ICU workers battling behind the scenes at Vancouver General Hospital. With the help of Vancouver Coastal Health, we're gonna bring you an up close inside look at one of the province's key facilities in the fight against coronavirus and find out how critical care staff are coping with the pandemic. That feature coming up at the bottom of the hour. Well, thousands of Canadians remain stuck in India tonight with no regular international flights likely for another month or so. While the federal government has organized two dozen repatriation flights so far, Bell Puri of the CBC Impact team is talking to critics who blame Ottawa for failing to get people home. It was supposed to have been a one-month visit. Now Sandeep Danju and her little girl have been in Punjab for twice as long. Them, I want them to come back home. Mohit Danju was to have joined his family overseas. When India barred foreign visitors due to COVID-19, he couldn't get in. When India went into lockdown, the other two couldn't get out. Actually, my daughter, she has a nut allergy, and uh, for that we carry EpiPen, and that EpiPen, my wife told me that has expired. Danju and his wife have failed to get seats on Canadian government repatriation flights. So we both keep searching. When she's sleeping, I search. When I'm sleeping, she keeps searching. In recent weeks, Canadian citizens have returned from India, but critics say government flights aren't enough for everyone who wants to come back. They're having difficulty with the system that's set up. They're frustrated. They've lost hope. Uh, and they've lost trust. Gina Takar's husband is in India on a work permit, training dogs for explosives and narcotics detection. In a bid to get him home, she came up with a plan to augment Ottawa's efforts. Her volunteer group arranged eight charters from Amritsar to Canada. Our goal was to bring back families with children, uh, bring back people that had acute illnesses, and then seniors that were running out of their medications that they couldn't replace in India. At the last minute, India revoked its permit for the flights. The reason why isn't clear. Seats on Canadian government repatriation flights are assigned to Canadian citizens whose names are on ROCA. That's the registration of Canadians abroad. Now, originally, 25,000 people put their name on that list. When surveyed, 4,000 were ready to pay $2,900 to fly home. The rest apparently willing to wait until commercial flights are back in the air. There have been 24 flights arranged by the federal government. The last ones will arrive between now and May 8th. If we have further interest from Canadians to come back, and we will make sure that we will put those flights in irrespective of what it takes. Takar wants government to implement her group's work and offer more flights immediately. I have begged, I have pleaded, I have cried in front of government officials saying, please let us help. We just want to work together. We've got, we've done 80% of the work. In the meantime, for Moet Danju, the wait to reunite with his family continues. How long they will have to stay there? Because I don't see any light at the end of the tunnel right now. Bell Perry, CBC News, Surrey. BC landlords are asking the province to increase the pandemic rental subsidy for rents due on May the 1st. The organization Landlord BC says rents in BC are so high, the subsidy should be raised from $300 to $750 for those with no dependents and from $500 to $1,000 for those with. While the association representing owners and managers of rental housing says it appreciates the government's help, they say they'd like to see the income test removed and have benefits extended through August instead of June.
Well, it's that time of year and starting this Friday, watering restrictions, yes. Watering restrictions go into effect in Metro Vancouver. So here's what you need to know so you don't get soaked with a fine. Those found breaking the rules could face fines of $250. It's an annual measure put in place to, of course, keep tabs on our drinking water levels at the reservoirs. Lawn watering is allowed at even-numbered residential addresses from 4 to 9 a.m. Wednesdays and Saturdays, odd-numbered homes can water at those times, but only on Thursdays and Sundays. I'm not sure we need to worry about it because I think there's a lot of rain coming. Am I right, Brett? <laughs> 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 As of right now, yeah, it looks like we're still going to be dealing with a bit of showers. So hearing about watering restrictions may catch a few people off guard, but of course it is important to make sure that we have enough for even the drier months ahead. Now right now you can see behind me, it's just kind of cloudy, a little bit drizzly here and there, but there is some heavier rain that's on the radar, and I want to show you that right now. Predominantly it's situated over portions of the southern Gulf Islands and southern Vancouver Island, and this very slowly is going to be making its way across parts of the lower mainland if it's not there already. Now it's not going to be a lot of rain but as I've been referring to frequently this month it's been quite a dry month so we really do need every millimeter here and we've only seen 19 millimeters so far. This is only just shortly higher than about 20 percent of our normal for the entire month ahead. Now this has also had the other downside if you've been enjoying those warm temperatures we had last week it's definitely cooler right now. I'm feeling it right now on this balcony you can see that temperature is hovering around 11 or 12 degrees and not much warmer on Vancouver Island as well. So when it comes to our forecast though, how is it going to be looking for the next little while? It's going to be cloudy throughout much of the night and we have that risk for showers here and there, but we're going to kind of have a repeat performance of today tomorrow. So that means tomorrow morning there's going to be a risk for showers and that will increase throughout the entire day. Now I'm going to have a full and complete look at the weather forecast all the way across the province when I come back and I'll let you know about the good news when it comes to our fire danger rating as well. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks Brett. Well, right now, flour has become about as hot as toilet paper. One of the most popular brands in Canada says it has plenty of product, but it has run out of those signature yellow bags to sell it in. Robin Hood will soon start packaging in nondescript brown and white bags instead. As Greg Rasmussen is finding out, demand for flour and other products like yeast speaks to a pandemic renaissance in home baking. I'm right now milling this to our sifted red spring flour. Milling grain used to be a sideline at this bakery and cafe. So this is our finished product. This has become white gold in a nation where flour and yeast are in short supply. So we started with whole grains before we started milling. The coffee shop part of this business has been shuttered. Its fresh flour has become an economic savior selling out every day. And I think just with the increase of people baking at home, they're seeking out some comfort and that's coming in the form of bread and cookies and biscuits. And so that has added additional pressure into the flour sales for sure. Thank you so much. No worries, have a good day. Many are posting their home-baked efforts online, a respite from all the bleak news. The world feels like it's ending. You go outside and there's like very few people are like lines and everyone's spaced apart. Or Isolated in his home, Brandon Lee says churning out cookies and cinnamon buns. So yeah, I'm just mixing through all the wet and dry ingredients. Helps pass the time. Every time I put something in the oven in the last like two weeks, I'm not sure if it's going to work out. And when it does, I'm very surprised. <laughs> I'm surprised again. Just delicious. One of the judges of the great Canadian baking show who has struggled with severe anxiety says making bread is therapeutic. It does create great memories, that's the way I feel it. It gives you a sense of control of your life and, uh, and bread can be quite challenging. And if you overcome that challenge, I think there is a feel good you know, attitude, you know, I made it, look at it. There's a sense of empowerment with baking and making your own food, especially a staple like bread. To be able to make that at home, it gives people a sense of calm and comfort. A few simple ingredients, but also a way to adapt, create and overcome. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Yeah, it's uh, it's all about the baking these days, isn't it? A I reason to get CBC Gem. They've got baking and cooking shows on that app, that's for sure. Is that <laughs> where you're free, getting all your tips? Where you can watch this newscast. <laughs> sure, yes, I'm getting all my all my tips from there, yes.
Uh, no, the kitchens uh, inside here are, are working overtime. I think they need it. Anyway, you can watch uh, our newscast on CBC Gem, of course, as well on the free app. CBC Vancouver also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. You can also follow Mike and me on Twitter and Instagram. Well, just ahead tonight, Canada's top doctor on how the country will gradually reopen and new projections tonight on the number of potential cases and deaths from COVID-19. Those stories coming next. Well, thanks so much for staying with us online for more news coverage during the television commercial break. All right, with some primary schools in Quebec set to open on May 11th, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was asked today if he would send his kids back to school in two weeks. Here's what he said. I'd want to know what the school was planning on doing, whether the desks were going to be properly spaced, whether uh, there would be plans at recess in terms of keeping people separated. These are all details that need to be worked out uh, to the satisfaction, not just of governments, but of, of the school boards, of teachers, of everyone who works in the schools, and especially of kids and their parents and grandparents. And of course, the school year is coming to a close for many colleges and universities. But since the pandemic started, instruction and testing has been online. Now, that's an experience that's left many students feeling shortchanged, particularly those in hands-on practical programs. Gianna Sumanak Johnson has their story. I'm going to make chocolate chip cookies. There is no stopping Maria Brigette from baking, even in the small kitchen of her basement apartment. But she'd rather be learning to do it in the professional kitchens of her program at Centennial College. So our program, it's more than, I don't know, let's say 70 or 80 percent in hands-on. So and not being able to learn techniques or recipes, it's kind of frustrating. Since universities and colleges went online, students in programs that require specialized equipment or a demonstration of a practical skill have been experiencing particular challenges. Maria Brigette received good grades, but especially as an international student who came here from Mexico, she doesn't feel she got her money's worth. We missed a little bit less than half of the semester, but we pay the same amount. For other students, not getting access to equipment means not finishing their final projects, crucial for entering their fields. Like this aspiring director, who was going to send his final project, an almost completed short film, to film festivals. When you're entering festivals and stuff, they're expecting that sort of highest level that you can possibly provide. And if you shoot footage on your iPhone or whatever, it's not going to match with the, the cinema cameras that the school is kind enough to let us use. Colleges like Toronto's George Brown say they've adapted the best they can, with instructors and students demonstrating skills in videos, from the culinary arts to welding. In some cases where it is lab-based, we plan to make opportunities for students to come back and uh, get access to that, those labs. The president of George Brown has a different kind of commencement speech for this year's grads. Be resilient, learn resilience, be innovative. Resilience and innovation that may be the recipe for a bright future, even if baking the cake of their dreams has to wait. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. As the tide seemingly turns against COVID-19, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer made it clear today provinces and territories won't all move at once to start lifting restrictions. It will depend on local conditions. But Dr. Theresa Tam revealed a lot more than that in her exclusive interview with the CBC. Take a look. So how do we get from this to a new normal? Reopening businesses, public spaces, the country. Dr. Theresa Tam paints a stark picture of what Canada could look like, a reinvention of how we work and interact. Come up with a plan of how your workplace could potentially be um, 
redesigned, have your shift a bit differently, your workflow might be different, you stagger people coming in so that you're not just your work shifts, but maybe your public transport means that you're not all crowded at the same rush hour. But it's a delicate balance. Health officials are aware of the dangerous consequences of a prolonged shutdown. Mental health problems, increased alcohol abuse, increased domestic violence, or minors in vulnerable situations. Tam knows physical distancing is hard and can't go on forever. But I do think that this sort of juncture is a particularly difficult one where people have contributed so much already. It's a bit like running the marathon and sort of hitting a bit that wall and you go, there's still another 10 kilometers before we're kind of here. Uh, it, is, it is tough. The cost of going fast with reopening the economy though is too great. A second surge of the pandemic before there's a vaccine or a treatment. I just have the image of New York City in my head and think I would never want that to happen anywhere in Canada. And if we let um, things resume too fast, we may get that kind of surge. The first phase of COVID-19 isn't even over, and already Tam is planning for the next one. In the next winter um, season, when um, it's not just living with uh, COVID-19, you're gonna get influenza, and so being able to uh, prepare for that is part of the new normal. A new normal that is being decided and planned right now, but will likely have to change again as Canadians learn to live with COVID-19 until a vaccine is found. Rosemary Barton, CBC News, Ottawa. All right, let's turn now to the new federal projections that show Canada is having success fighting this virus. Salima Shivji has the latest snapshot of COVID-19 in Canada and how that picture is set to change. A glimmer of hope mixed with caution. In many parts of the country, the curve has flattened, but we're not out of the woods yet. We're in the middle of the most serious public health emergency Canada has ever seen. But there is good news in the data. Across the country, the spread of the virus is slowing down. One infected person now infects only one other Canadian. The number of cases doubling every 16 days now, not every three like just a few weeks ago, because of strict physical distancing. It is really slowing down. But those positive signs are up against the sobering reality. A heavy death toll concentrated among the most vulnerable. 79% of COVID-19 deaths clustered in long-term care and seniors' homes. And outbreaks are raging in other places, too, where distancing is an issue. Meatpacking plants, prisons, and homeless shelters. That means even as the confirmed cases start to slow, more people have died than expected. From 2.2% on April the 9th to 5.5% as of April the 27th. We are seeing the tragic paradox of the epidemic playing out that paradox most acute in Canada's largest provinces, Quebec and Ontario. Federal officials now project deaths from COVID-19 could reach nearly 3,900 by this time next week, about 1,100 more than right now, even as provinces outline the path forward to ease some restrictions. What we really happy to see is that every jurisdiction uh, have said that we really need to move cautiously. Cautious and gradual. That's what all the provinces have agreed to in a set of new federal guidelines, making sure testing and healthcare capacity are up to par as they all try to navigate the delicate balance of reopening their economies without prompting a resurgence of cases. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. An extraordinary event today. Hundreds of MPs took part in a virtual meeting, a replacement of question period. The first question, la première question, goes to the leader of the opposition, Mr. Scheer. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The speaker was in a committee room in Ottawa, but the rest of the MPs were in their homes or offices. They used a reconfigured version of Zoom with enhanced security measures. The focus was on the COVID-19 crisis, and as in all virtual meetings, participants were able to turn off their cameras. RCMP in Nova Scotia say the man who killed 22 people left the area where the first attacks took place just minutes after police arrived. 
and I managed to evade them for almost 13 hours. Based on the call detail records that we have through our operational communication center, uh, it shows our first uh, unit arriving on the scene at uh, 1026 in the evening. And uh, since that time, uh, we've obtained a statement from an area resident that believed that the time that they saw a vehicle uh, moving through a field was uh, at around uh, 1035. RCMP say they now know the gunman spent the night in an industrial area 26 kilometers away, leaving just before 6 a.m. and committing other murders. They said the first woman who was attacked has been a key and an ongoing witness. They also said they've been talking with relatives of the gunmen who are retired RCMP officers, but they made it clear there is no evidence the relatives provided any assistance or gave him equipment. The RCA, RCMP rather confirmed that among his guns, the man had an assault-style weapon and that in addition to killing and shooting people, he also killed animals and pets inside residences. Well, do you have some burning COVID-19 questions? Send them our way. After the break, the president and CEO of Fraser Health is here. Dr. Victoria Lee taking your questions. Call us 604-662-6801 or send your inquiries in our live chat on Facebook and YouTube. And thanks for staying with us online for more COVID-19 news coverage during the television commercial break. Well, it's a term that's coming up quite a bit lately, herd immunity. But what is it? How does a region get it? Stephanie Matisse explains. The science of immunity. The uh, Pan-Canadian Task Force on Immunity to figure out uh, what uh, is the reality around immunity. Herd immunity happens when enough people build a resistance to a virus. It happens in two ways, catching the infection from someone or getting a vaccine. And in this case, we know a vaccine is still a long way off. There's been an expectation maybe that herd immunity may have been achieved and that the majority of people in society may already have developed antibodies. Uh, I think the, the general evidence is pointing against that. A region achieves herd immunity when enough people have antibodies to a disease so it stops spreading. Most health experts think aiming for herd immunity through exposure is risky. The reality is, is that we can't control the, how this disease spreads in the population. Once we start experiencing epidemic growth, people get infected very, very quickly and very quickly our health system gets overwhelmed. Especially since there's no precedent for COVID-19 in humans, it has a high attack rate and everybody is susceptible to it. The idea of um, sort of generating natural immunity um, is actually not something that we is not something that uh, I think should be um, undertaken. Um, I, I personally think that, you know, we, as the chief medical officers, we would, you know, really be extremely cautious about that kind of approach. Plus about 60% of us would have to have antibodies to achieve the right level of immunity. There are blood tests to figure this out. We are definitely finding people who don't have a record of being infected, don't remember being symptomatic, who have antibodies that suggest that they, their immune system actually mounted a response. And Canada has established an immunity task force to look into this. One hopes that eventually we'll test a you know, random sample of the population um, and see, have, you know, is there evidence that they have been exposed to this infection? It's still early days to know how many of us have been exposed, if we're immune, and how long that might last. There seem to be a lot of regions who are putting out studies that are sh showing, you know, 5% or less of the population have been infected. In general, you know, there's, there's no study that's come out that said that we're at herd immunity. In hotspots like New York or on cruise ships, Scientists say more people might be immune because of the high infection rates, but even those numbers are low. In Canada, we haven't measured this at all. And scientists say because of physical distancing measures, our exposure rates likely are also low. But knowing for sure could make a difference in how we move forward. The decisions that we make regarding social distancing may be different for a community that has no herd immunity. So this may play a major role as we move forward into a next phase of response. Stephanie Matisse, CBC News, Toronto.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Every decision, every order that we've done, every restriction is based on that risk assessment that we have been doing and on focused on breaking those chains of transmission of COVID-19 in our families, in our communities. And Dr. Bonnie Henry says that strategy is working to flatten the COVID-19 curve here in BC. She reported 55 new cases today, most connected to known outbreaks at local poultry processing plants. Hospitalizations continue to fall in our province, but two more people have died, bringing our death toll to 105. The biggest problem with not knowing dates and times is, is the inability to plan. And I actually think that the ministry is in the same position. Although some provinces are planning to reopen schools next month, there's no plan for BC at this point. The province says it's still studying how and when to resume in-class learning while trying to learn lessons from other jurisdictions that do open. See my daughter, she has a nut allergy. And uh, for that, we carry EpiPen. And that EpiPen, my wife told me that has expired. BC families say attempts to arrange evacuation flights for relatives stuck in India have been challenging. They say there has been frequent lapses in communication on the part of Canadian government officials. Thousands are still stuck there. Some 2,400 have returned since India went into lockdown last month. Well, they are on the front line in the battle against COVID-19 at BC's biggest hospital. And tonight, CBC News is there with them. In this exclusive report, our Tanya Fletcher finds out what life has been like behind the scenes for ICU workers at Vancouver General. Wait, we're going into the COVID unit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Critical care workers at BC's biggest hospital brace for the patients they know are coming even before they arrive. Once a routine task, donning medical gear is now anything but simple, wearing it like being underwater. It's a little bit surreal, to be honest with you. It feels like you're scuba diving almost. It's a comparison Dr. Donald Grisdale never thought he'd make. You're wearing your visor, you're wearing your face mask, your respirator, your gowns and your gloves. It just feels a little bit surreal because you literally have that barrier between you and the outside world. He's an ICU physician at Vancouver General Hospital where the front lines are divided in two the hot zone and the warm zone. The hot zone is where the infected patients themselves are examined and treated. The warm zone is a buffer space that acts as a staging zone for medical workers. Each team spends three hours making the rounds inside the hot zone before peeling off all their personal protective equipment, washing their hands like lives depend on it, and then rotating out. When the nurses come out of the hot zone into the warm zone, they're usually drenched in sweat. You can see their mask that's outlined on their face. And so when one team comes out into the warm zone, another team of nurses goes in. Can you wipe down your mask? They set up a really good two-way communication system so that we're able to easily communicate with the staff that's inside the hot zone. The warm zone is also where the whole team of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, dietitians, and even pharmacists convene and communicate. They discuss the issues for each patient and come up with individual care plans for the day. And two days of shortness of breath fever called the um, 911. Nurses are the main point of contact for patients. There's an underlying uncertainty on both sides that's hard to describe. Mostly it's fear of the unknown. In a word, scary, says ER nurse Jess Donald. They're scared when they come in, right? They're scared of getting a breathing tube put in. They're scared of what's going to happen. Uh, and we're scared for them, to be honest. Her biggest daily struggle is finding human interaction in a unit that's defined by isolation. It's just not being able to have their family come visit. We've been trying to get around that with FaceTiming and other ways of using technology to really connect them with their families. But I think the biggest theme that we get from them is the isolation. One particular case stands out for Dr. Grisdale. He recalls treating a young woman who'd grown seriously ill with coronavirus. It was really hard because every day I would phone her husband who's at home sick himself with his kids and having to say, well, your wife's not doing well or she's getting worse. And I just sort of put myself in 
that position. Like, what would it be like if that was my wife in there? And it was really, you know, I found it emotionally quite difficult. So how do they cope with the pressure, the weight of a global pandemic on their shoulders day after day? Well, the support from the community is what keeps them going. Feeding the front lines has been so great with sending us food, making masks for us. It's that kindness, I think, that's really permeates through when we're feeling so isolated and we're not alone that you know there's this whole we're in this together movement and I really feel that and for all the thanks a thank you in return it's thankful to the social distancing and people all the sacrifices that people have made that have allowed us to really deal with all the patients that have come with us so yes we see it on the front lines absolutely but I certainly understand the personal sacrifices that the public is making as well the gratitude goes on display at precisely 7 p.m. every day keep cheering for us at 7 p.m. it really gives us life like it brings tears to my eyes every time I come out yes, it's been really heartening it's certainly been the most fulfilling time in my career bar none and tucked away on a wall in their ICU this reminder that what's audible outside is felt inside every minute of every day Tanya Fletcher CBC News Vancouver so that's the situation inside Vancouver General Hospital. But what about in the Fraser Valley? Joining me now is Dr. Victoria Lee. She's the president and CEO of the Fraser Health Authority and has a wealth of experience dealing with crisis ones like SARS, the H1N1 pandemic and the avian flu. Thanks for coming on the show today, Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for having me, Anita. Now, Fraser Health's cases have climbed above Vancouver Coastal Health. I'm curious about the process of how public health actually tracks all possible contacts of someone who has COVID. So can you take us through the process, uh, you know, the role that the public health nurse has in that case? Yeah, that's a great question. And sometimes I say they are the unsung heroes behind the scenes because they're the pandemic detectives. Uh, what happens is that whenever there's a case of um, uh, COVID-19, uh, that uh, person is contacted. And then we look at uh, the risk assessment of that uh, uh, case. And with that, we uh, trace and identify all of the potential contacts. And all of those potential contacts are also co uh, contacted and notified by our public health nurses, Allied Health, and then they're monitored for 14 days for any symptoms and, of course, yeah, in case of a need. And there's some heroic stories even throughout that journey that I hear about uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as well. I like that, the pandemic detectives. Um, mm -hmm. A viewer on our COVID-19 Facebook group asks, is there any BC data to suggest that genetics play a role in severity of disease in the U.S., African-American and Latino communities um, are disproportionately affected, this person says. It appears useful to know if one is at a higher risk. Does, does Fraser mm -hmm. Health have any plans to collect or release this, this demographic data? Yeah, I think that's an important question as we look at uh, what's going on elsewhere in Canada as well as globally and the, uh, some of the preliminary studies in the U.S. have found that uh, there are a disproportionate uh, number of people, whether they're Latin American or African American, that have been affected. And uh, from early data, it looks as though uh, there are multiple factors. One is that there might be more underlying conditions. Uh, there might be also working in settings that are more difficult to physically distance. And thirdly, they might also have more difficulty accessing healthcare services as well. Uh, so I think those have been some of the areas that we've uh, th that uh, preliminary studies have shown. And of course, there's more work that's going on behind the scenes. In Fraser Health, we actually have uh, almost 90% of refugee population and 40% of newcomers that settle in our region and the 1.8 million people that we serve. And this is an important question that we are looking at closely as well. There's been some evidence of either deadly or debilitating strokes happening in young COVID-19 patients who are asymptomatic. To be fair, the numbers are small, but what are your stroke specialists telling you in Fraser Health? Are they seeing this happen at all? Yes, and uh, I think some of those uh, um, cases from elsewhere and uh, case studies uh, clinically have been shared uh, globally. And uh, if you look at a COVID, uh, if you look at COVID nineteen, it's also a virus, and viruses can cause inflammation of your brain, which can then lead to strokes. Uh, specifically in Fraser, we've not had those types of cases and uh, young people that have been affected that way. But of course, something that we do. Um, have 
have uh, uh, specialists and clinicians that uh, pay attention to in terms of international literature and ensuring that we're uh, keeping an eye out on that issue whenever we do have uh, uh, new cases that are and patients that present to our hospitals. Jasmine Fryer on Facebook asks, what is the likelihood that vaccination won't be a viable option either because we can't develop an immunity or because it mutates into too many different strains? Mm. Well, really a uh, great question. So in terms of vaccination and herd immunity, I think you heard earlier about the importance of uh, ensuring that uh, it's not just a one model or one uh, uh, solution, but as Dr. Henry has mentioned uh, multiple times that uh, there's a whole, uh, I think, uh, com uh, comprehensive measures that we have been preparing for uh, with our pandemic response. And that includes population health measures, such as individual measures like physical distancing as well. Uh, the day-to-day -day things that we recommend around hand hygiene, um, uh, what you do with cough and uh, ensuring that uh, uh, we don't have mass events, all of those things add up to uh, what we're seeing in terms of flattening the curve. And then immunizations, of course, is another area uh, with herd immunity. So I think it's too early to tell what the uh, vaccine might look like, uh, but certainly I am hopeful with a lot of uh, uh, both national and international uh, researchers that have been working in this area that we would have uh, a vaccine that would be viable uh, in the uh, 12 to 18 month period. I've actually heard a lot of people curious about this next question. Facility, uh, Felicity rather emailed in to say, I love sushi and sashimi, Japanese raw fish, but my wife told me only cooked food does not carry coronavirus, whereas raw fish transmits COVID-19 and is dangerous. Is this true? Well, that's an interesting one, and I have not heard that before. Um, so uh, certainly in terms of uh, food safety, uh, raw fish or eating any other raw meats uh, carries other uh, concerns of uh, transmission of uh, uh, disease. Uh, but in terms of coronavirus or other viruses, I think uh, those apply to all kinds of food safety. So whenever you can cook food, of course, it can get rid of uh, bacteria, uh, viruses. Uh, when you eat raw food, uh, you do have um, added risk uh, that you take of uh, whether it's hepatitis A or other viruses that you have. Okay, Anne called in to ask, what can people with disabilities do to lessen their suffering if they need services like chiro massage and can't access them right now? Yeah, it's been a very difficult time for many people, whether you're um, staying uh, physically away from your loved ones or if you have loved ones at uh, hospitals or long-term care facilities or if you are somebody that's disabled and and uh, uh, acquiring some of those services, whether it's rehab or massage therapy. I think it's a lot of these areas we have been trying our best to uh, enhance and augment our services virtually wherever it's possible, wherever it's possible to have caregiver uh, that can be uh, trained to provide some of these services as well. So there's been a lot of great creative solutions to uh, reduce some of the impacts of uh, not having some of these services. And uh, I hope that we see a con continuation of creativity, innovation to ensure that uh, um, those types of services can continue. And just really quickly here, we have two people asking a similar question, Jamin and Gwen. Um, is there evidence that having the COVID-19 virus creates immunity or what do we know about the risk of reinfection for those who have re who recovered? Yes, so in terms of uh, reinfection and immunity with COVID-19, uh, as with other viruses, uh, one would, uh, one, one could uh, look at uh, usual trajectory of somebody getting infected and then having some level of immunity. I think the level of immunity from this uh, virus is still uh, to be determined. And uh, what we've so far found when there's uh, uh, someone that had tested positive for COVID-19 and then test neg negative and then positive again, there's a lot of other factors that go into play, whether it's uh, the, um, uh, the type timing of the testing, whether it could be late into the infection or end of infection. Uh, it could be also methodology of testing as well as uh, the test that's being used. So a lot of factors are going to play, but certainly in terms of uh, immunity, uh, if it acts like other viruses, that there's a certain level of uh, immunity. We just don't know uh, how much and how long. Dr. Victoria Lee, President and CEO of Fraser Health, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much for having me. 
Just coming up on quarter to seven, live look across at the North Shore and downtown Vancouver on this Tuesday evening. It's Tuesday, right? It's hard to keep track. Bit of everything today on the South Coast. What's in store for the rest of the week? Brett's forecast is coming next. to the flood situation in Alberta now, and it is being called a one in 100 year flood, the worst since 1934. A nearly 25 kilometer long ice jam on the Athabasca River has displaced thousands of people from Fort McMurray. It appears to have shortened a bit overnight, but as Rafi Bujakanian tells us, officials say conditions could change without warning. For long-time Fort McMurray residents, the emergency food pickups are all too familiar. We went through the wildfire and everything else, so everybody in town's pretty much used to the bottled water. In fact, this is the third evacuation for the laid laws. After the fire and a previous flood, they admit it's hard to keep it all straight. Almost like the whole town forgot there was uh, even a pandemic on the go. Even just the difference in... You know, before in the grocery stores, people almost held their breath before you walked by. And now people are 
over and or not over engaged but engaged to make sure that you know you're okay the ice jams that caused all this shrank a little overnight but the blockage is still more than twice the size of a football field this former mle's house was destroyed in the 2016 fire the one he was building to replace it now severely damaged i'm a bit troubled by what's going on but uh, you know we're going to survive we're going to get through this Still, Gene says he's been through worse. In 2015, he lost his son to illness. And after that, it's pretty uh, easy to take the rest. I don't want to lose this stuff, but it is just stuff. You can replace it. As for the municipality, local officials initially wanted the army to step in. They're now stepping back from that after the province said this. There is no reasonable engineering solution to unlock the ice jams at this point. We have to rely on warm weather to soften the ice. And while Ottawa says it's standing by to help if asked, the Alberta government says it's got things under control and hopes the coming warm and sunny weather will keep melting the ice jam. Rafi Bujikani, CBC News, Edmonton. Not a great situation there for certain. Uh, joined now by meteorologist Brett Soderholm with uh, a look at our forecast. We got a little bit of everything today, Brett. We really did, and uh, whether or not you like today, it is just going to be a repeat performance for tomorrow. We're expecting another period of showers, some dry conditions yet again, and temperatures just on a little bit below where seasonal should be for this time of year. And I'm going to walk you through what we can be expecting all the way across the province, starting on the south coast, just to show you for the next couple of hours, there's still going to be that risk for showers, but largely much of the overnight is going to be remaining dry. It's going to be once again tomorrow late morning into the early afternoon where the potential is there to be accumulating anywhere between I would say five to ten millimeters but most likely on the lower end of that range probably only about five millimeters or so now where this rain is all coming from we have a separate system that's making its way up from the southwest this is going to be bringing some more heavier rain I would say to portions of northern Vancouver Island and then certainly bringing a few scattered showers as well to places in the interior for places like Prince George and Williams Lake that are of course monitoring their own flooding situation we're not looking at any significant additional rainfall at this point in time. Now the good news in all of this, the fact that it's been a little bit cooler and a little bit rainier has allowed our fire danger rating really just to plummet across the south and central coasts and for Vancouver Island which does bode very well because it of course was quite high just a week ago. On the note of high temperatures in parts of the Okanagan tomorrow we're going to be into the low to mid 20s. Well here on the south coast we're going to be hovering right around that 15 degree mark and that trend is going to be continuing right through essentially till the end of the week. And in terms of sunshine if you've just been itching for that if you've been waiting for a return of the sunshine that is going to be more so on Thursday and into Friday and then as we begin a new month of May it's going to be a pretty soggy start to the month but hey this is what happens in this side of the world eh? <laughs> all right thanks Brett and okay to the two of you you know people are wondering if you too fall into this category with so many journalists working from home a wardrobe malfunction was inevitable it had to happen and it happened today on Good Morning America. Take a look. The people won't be getting their medication dropped out of the sky into their mailbox just yet, but the companies do say they will scale up the program if it is successful, guys. Very cool. We love it, Will. Thank you. The reporter is Will Reeve, who happens to be the son of the late Christopher Reeve. In a note he shared on Twitter, Will says he was just trying to be efficient with his wardrobe as he prepared for a workout after his report. Well, where there's a will, there's a way, especially when it came to celebrating this veteran's birthday during the pandemic. We'll show you the surprise Margaret Houston got for her 102nd birthday next.
This is a call out to any junior scavenger hunters. CBC Vancouver's digital scavenger hunt is taking place April 27th until May 1st. Kids of all ages can take part in this scavenger hunt from home. Participate every day for more chances to win a limited edition CBC Vancouver backpack full of prizes. Plus, you could score an invite to an exclusive online concert with Will Strode from Will's Jams. For more info, head to cbc.ca slash scavenger hunt. Well, a World War II veteran who celebrated her 102nd birthday had a big surprise from Vancouver police and the public. What's it mean to my mom? Yeah. I think recognition. Uh, we, we don't do a lot for our elderly. They get unnoticed. Uh, she's a World War II uh, former Air Force officer. She's done a lot for her country, and I think I, I, I can't really speak for her. I just say I, I think I'm guessing, but um, I think she just feels very loved. Is that right? She's very happy. Margaret Houston sat outside her West End home with her daughter as she watched members of the Vancouver Police Horse Unit, as well as dozens of neighbors, cheer for her on her birthday. Members of the VPD Mounted Unit organized the surprise because Margaret enjoys watching the horses as often as uh, they do pass by her home. Happy birthday, Margaret. Uh, that is, yeah, that's fantastic. 102. Happy birthday, Margaret. Okay, that's about uh, all the time we have. Uh, I think, uh, well, Dan's here at 11 after the National, but the show is uh, going to the birds again tonight, Anita. We're always going to the birds. Love the birds. Another shot uh, from the Vernon area by CBC listener and viewer Claude Rio. This time it's a heron on the prowl for fish. Take a look at that. Have a good night.